Hey guys, welcome back to the Short Story Commission. Sorry, I've been kind of radio silent. It's been a little bit crazy here in Brooklyn of late, as some of you saw. Um, we are here with Rebecca. Is it Test Strike? Did I say yeah. that? Yeah, good job. Most people, yeah, it's the anglicized version, which most people don't do. <laughs> what do most people say? Test Rocky, which is Ooh. closer to the original, but uh, I'm pretty far removed from that at this point. So, so I have solidarity with that because we don't know if my last name is German, French, or Swedish. Oh, so, wow. in Southern Illinois, they say Schaubert, which is a nice Irish pronunciation of a German name. Yeah, <laughs> I would go with Swedish, Irish, Catholic thing. Out here, they say Schaubert, which is the whole Ooh. juggling Schaubert's joke. And then in Germany, they're like Schaubert, which like only a handful of linguists get right in America. So, yeah, so. I think I would go with Schubert. Schubert, I got Sherbert in high school, and then people would throw ice cream at me. So, I love ice now cream. I'm lactose intolerant. So, that's how bad the trauma was, I guess. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rebecca is on the Spartan <laughs> team, and she is editing through what is actually kind of a first draft. Um, and we're, I, I just want to illuminate, you know, this this whole process for me is kind of exposing in a lot of ways because I'm used to having a very, very polished manuscript, sending that to an editor, getting it rejected, and then after about 10 of those, one of them sells. So like lifting the hood on something is pretty scary for me, uh, especially when it's serialize a longer form thing and especially when that is a piece of a longer novel that i'm working on selling which is a piece of a trilogy that i'm that i've been working on so uh and none of those things have sold except for the four short stories that spark and echo was courteous enough to buy uh from me for their uh, artist and residency piece which i'm super super grateful for because what that allows me to do is to kind of say look they're paying me to do this work anyway so I can actually just share the work as we go. And hopefully that'll create a more interesting uh, narrative of like start to finish for them. And then hopefully by the end of it, we'll have something that's like a decent story. If not, it'll be in like a beautiful look at failure uh, for everyone. <laughs> so uh, one way or another, you guys benefit. I might look like a complete fool by the end of it, but I'm grateful to, Spark and Echo for, for kind of picking uh, me up on that. The last time I was talking a little bit about moments of misbelief. And uh, although I wasn't live streaming um, through the month of February, I got really, really sick. I don't know if any of you guys, uh, which you can chat in the short story commission. Hopefully it's not the end of the one. Hey, that's me. Um, uh, and I can respond to that over there and then probably in the other uh, chat window. Um, but yeah, I got super sick in February. We went out to a producer's house out in Long Island and I caught what they caught and a retreat turned into like a, <laughs> a, a ICU unit <laughs> over, uh, over there. But, uh, so that's why I didn't stream a lot of that, but I'm going to pop up Scrivener if it'll let me share my screen here. Screen share application window. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna pop this up. Give me two seconds here. Is that showing up? I see it. Okay, cool. So, um, so this is the this is the story. It's actually the first chapter of of the novel, and it is going to be over in a different screen because we're gonna edit live via Google Docs, but. Uh, what I want to show about Scrivener is a couple things. First is because um, I'm, I'm really, really bad at outlines. Um, anyone that worked with me on any like academic nonfiction ever would say, yeah, he's terrible at that, um, which is why I kind of default over the, the poetry and fiction into the spectrum because I bury the lead naturally. <laughs> so <laughs> so th that's the best place to do it. But the problem with that is if you don't, bring that back to the surface during the climax, the main point of the piece, uh, you end up kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So this helps me keep track of things kind of organically when I wouldn't be an outliner. Um, so Scrivener 
turns chapters into um, like separate RTF files that then you can drag around. So here's chapter one, chapter two, and you can actually drag them into a different order. And that will change the order of the manuscript when you compile it as a final document. So it makes it really, really easy to like bunch all these chapters and sections together. Um, so because of that, if you nest it right, this is actually book one that I'm finished and is out about seven or so different agents are reading it right now. Um, and that's, that's novel one. Novel two is here. Novel three is here. And this is the one uh, we're working on for Spark and Echo. There's four pieces over the long haul um, that we're going to work on. I'm going to try to give samples of these two brothers and, and pulling from kind of their prompt, which was about uh, mainly two brothers. Um, in terms of outline, I wanted to show you this because um, kind of we'll give you a, a, a look into what, let's see here, I'm gonna pull up. Uh, I'm outlining this on a, on a new system that I don't normally use. It's called the Mice Quotient, uh, which was kind of pioneered by Orson Scott Card. And it's gonna let me pull it up here. Uh, let's see, open image and new tab. All right, let's see if this will switch over presentation screen here in two seconds screen share application window okay so the mice quotient is kind of the components that that make a story and this is how i outline this novel um i like trying frames in new ways uh so a milieu is is driven is a story that's driven by place so your character enters a new space like gulliver's travels struggles to exit, tries to survive in it, attempts to navigate, all kinds of barriers come up, like you see the treasure map there. And then your character exits the space. That's the end of the story. So there's a struggle here and it's just ways of orienting conflict. Um, so that's the M, the I in mice is inquiry, which is driven by questions. Your character asks a question like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, they're lied to, they can't understand, they have dead end answers, red herrings, and then they answer the question is the end of the story. A uh, story driven by angst is uh, like your character's unhappy with some internal aspect of themselves, like Catcher in the Rye. Um, and then they try to change their ways. They attempt to break out of their role. They have self-loathing. Maybe they are arrogant. And then they have this new understanding of self. This is most, <laughs> honestly, most Iron Man plots are actually oriented around his arrogance. Um, so that's, most Iron Man plots are actually internal. Uh, and then driven by action, something disrupts your character's status quo, like Godzilla or like Pacific Rim or like The Walking Dead first episode. And then they try to set things right, fights, chases, explodes, builds, you know, anything you can do to keep out The Walking Dead and then this status quo is solidified. This is Walking Dead over and over and over again. There's status quo, we get a wall or something and then something happens to disrupt that. A lot of times other people. And then right down at the bottom, if you see can you see that at the bottom there, Rebecca? Yeah, I sure can. Okay, so if you treat multiple mice elements like nesting code in HTML, opening and closing them in inverse order, kind of like chiastic, that is how you end up having multiple plot points dovetailing in the same climax. So this is, this is key to what I'm getting ready to show you. Um, milieu, character, you close the character arc, and then you close the milieu arc. So you start it open it and close it. And I actually add, I actually treat it like code and add uh, an X for the, you know, the middle part here, like the struggle to exit or is lied to the change, setting things right, which is the, did they accomplish it? Yes, but it gets worse. Did they accomplish it? No, and it gets worse. Like either way it gets worse <laughs> until, <laughs> it's just always getting worse until they answer the question. Um, and the reason, you know, um, that, uh, Captain America was kind of rough as a film is like, it was like, no, and it gets worse. No, and it gets worse. No, and it gets worse. And then after act two, it was just, yes, yes, yes. He just solves all the problems. And it kind of felt like unrealistic. So let's strap back over to the four hammers and a song, the hammers trilogy. 
as I refer to it, white trash magic. And up here you'll see uh, TC, HE. So these are characters. Capital T is Tobias, capital H is Hayden. And each of them is uh, opening story arcs. So Tobias's is a character issue, Hayden's is an uh, event issue. The X is how the conflict complicates it. And then later on, when they start closing, you see it here. There's a close of, of the event issue, of the milieu issue. Um, easiest way to see this is if we go over to the character screen. So here's a maze for Toby. All right. So character, he feels restricted and tied down to something he's not. Now, we, this is the principles of antagonism, that piece I was talking about last time. Uh, you can find this if you if you Google uh, if you go up and Google um, an outline for Pantsers Writers Digest. Uh, I published a piece in Writers Digest a while back about uh, how to outline via antagonism, and that's kind of that's Toby's. But oriented orienting the outline the other way around some of these mice quotient things. Uh, he starts out feeling restricted and tied down to something he's not, so he tries to untie his self, and he, he feels more restrictions. He's basically trying to get out of Southern Illinois and into a magical world. Um, a is the question. Like, his main question is, where did magic come from? Because no one in Southern Illinois has magic. <laughs> so, like, this is completely useless if you're going to be farming and doing carpentry and shoveling shit. You know, like, the, so what... Where did that come from? Uh, the milieu is he's leaving Southern Illinois for the broader universe, which is kind of the guardians of the galaxy kind of move. Um, e is this world he's on um, shatters like a, like a crystal ball or a, like a snow globe. And so the response to that is fixing the world in a Kintsugi kind of way, which I can talk about later, uh, returning the milieu back to Southern Illinois from the universe uh, meets the good Lord in Southern Illinois again. Turns out magic comes from the good Lord, not from uh, some magician, uh, which is an ontological thing. It's a philosophical thing, um, metaphysical thing, whatever word you want to use. And then uh, closing out the character art, he comes to see that the restrictions are just boundaries in which to build something beautiful, kind of like a sandbox. Hayden has a completely different arc. Uh, this is his little brother. Uh, his, his is an event thing, which is a crushing economic environment, character feeling unsafe, question he wants to know what humor can fix and whether it can fix tragedy. Um, that's shorthand for kind of like the Sarah Rule move of is there a joke that's so funny it can kill you, um, which is kind of a magic trick. And then the milieu is the, the world that shatters in Toby's arc, it's a, it's an event problem. There's this, and he can never get his brother out into the broader universe. In Hayden's story, that's a Malou move because he leaves, and that's a different experience for him, which is what, that's how conflict works in interpersonal relationships. Um, closes out Milu, he finds the world's funniest joke, uh, feels safe, and then the economic environment improves for his grandkids because of his choice to venture outside of Southern Illinois and his brother's input. That is a very, very, very quick uh, way to show uh, the mice quotient. And it starts off here in the middle of this chapter. So specifically Toby's character issue is he's asking for the magic of St. Peter. He feels restricted and tied down. He wants keys to the kingdom. And he really wants to get out of Southern Illinois. Hayden asks for the provision of Elijah, feels the economic environment is crushing him at home. He really wants safe humors, safe pleasures, common things like marriage and a creed and the slow maturing of old jokes. It's all right up here. Can you see that on the, on the card there, Rebecca? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, that is the broad overview of kind of outlining where we're going. Now, these are all from last time. These are my moments of misbelief, like, you know, a magic show. He saw some abuse things that happen to Hayden, different things. Um, but that's, that's all going to feed into this. So in 1999 uh, is where we're starting. And I'm going to kick it over to Rebecca's screen here, if it'll pop me back open. So uh, right now, if you guys want to, uh, you can look at the chat window in Google Chrome. I'm going to pull that off. And there is a 
uh, little link there for the Google Docs, uh, and you can feel free to comment along if you'd like. Uh, I'm no gonna point this way and hope that the link is over that way, or maybe it's down here. It's actually to, it would be to your left. Yeah, there this you go. Way. So, <laughs> Steve Jobs Steve moved there. Yeah. So yeah, it's over, it's over there on the left. And that'll, in theory, if there's a live chat replay, I know this is kind of last minute for some of you or many of you, um, but uh, in theory, you can go over there and kind of see as we go check over the revisions. Uh, I made it so that anyone seeing the link can comment. Uh, comment, I just said comment. That was a Southern Illinois slip for me. But uh, but I'm gonna kick it over to Rebecca and she's gonna be reading through this for the first time. So, uh, you know, bring out your kid gloves for her sake <laughs> because it's kind of live uh, for her too. And then I am going to just kind of riff as I go. The hope is that this will illustrate how Almost always, beta readers and editors get the diagnostics right. Um, sometimes they get the prescription right. Sometimes they get it wrong. But almost always when they say, there's something weird here, um, they've noticed something that does need fixed or fixing. That does need fixing. I think that's right. Um, anyway. It are broken. It are. It done been broke. Did it? It done broke. Uh, um, so I have never read this before, just no, for the viewers. I haven't no. either. I don't even know. <laughs> I, <just laughs> uh, I guess that brings up the question of like, if you write, does it count as you read? I don't know. Ooh, I yeah. Know. Mm. I read all the time. Everything I write. Yeah. Do you, it probably counts. Anyway, I feel like that's a philosophical, a philosophical question that could be a big mess. I'm going to leave it alone. Does it um, literate in the woods? Yeah, but for the reader or well, viewers, because I'm a reader, and you're mm -hmm. a reader, and maybe there'll be viewers, readers too. I've not read this yet, um, so this is my first time reading through it. I actually have been behaving myself, and while Lancelot has been introducing it, I have not even sneaked a peek. I've, I've been real good. Um, so I'm gonna mute myself because I am not necessarily good at like talking and thinking and writing at the same time. Um, but I think Lancelot, you're going to provide commentary. Yeah, in theory. Yeah, I can, so, I can only talk. That's the only thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> so my face is going to go away if there's something that I feel like I need to respond to with Lancelot or tell Lancelot, then you'll hear me. But otherwise, you probably will not. So. Hey, quick question: is is this only in small when it looks weird on my code, or is it like Willy Wonking on your screen too? Um, it looks pretty okay, except when you're moving. Oh, that it's not the best resolution in the whole wide world. But when you hold still, it's fine. On the small version on my screen, it looks like David Bowie's Labyrinth. But Ooh. sorry, <laughs> this, this may have been a terrible mistake if I'm getting. I'm not easily distracted. Designs. All right, uh, let's <laughs> try this. And uh, Lancelot dressed up just for this. Yeah, that's right, just for this. There was no other that reason for a suit today. What I am claiming. Okay, here we go. <laughs> bye, friends. I mean, not bye. I'll be here, but yeah, you know. Okay. If you want a playlist for this, I'm not legally allowed to play music. So I would recommend um, Damien Gerardo's. Uh, Ohio. I have a playlist that starts with that. Maybe I'll 10, 20, 15 minutes in, I'll give you another suggestion if you want to pull something else up on Spotify or Apple Music. I mean, Google Play is the one that gives you the most, but anyway, so she's reading here. Uh, Rebecca, I'd recommend being extra verbose with your commentary, anything that comes to mind. Um, we have... We should probably make sure that we're marking. Yeah, there you go. Did you get it? Do you see it? Is it I great? see it, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. I'm gonna, okay. I'm going to go back to quiet now. <laughs> You're good. Make sure you're presenting too, so that they can see that. Because otherwise, there we go.
Yeah, scroll over there. There we go. Okay, so here's a great example. Um, and like I said, Rebecca, if this starts distracting you, coat's coming off, folks. Here we go. Um, you can't even see me taking off my coat. That was completely pointless except for warmth. Um, so, like, um, she's writing the rule of three there for comedy. That's actually something I'm teeing up for the end of the book. Sometimes I'll write the – they may not even stay there, but sometimes I'll write – short stories and novels. I'll write the first and last phrase as a kind of, you know, chiastic earmark of, I don't want to say yin and yang, but you get what I'm saying, hot and cold kind of call and response thing. So she's writing that. It's kind of, it's going to riff on that. Uh, the main focus of this piece as as she's editing was for me to um, have this kind of dialogue between the uh, like types of brothers, um, partly based on Samuel Taylor Coolridge and and William Wordsworth's relationship. And I, and I think it was an overflow of their personalities, but I think it was, um, I, I, you know, part of it's just kind of creative limitations, to, like what they chose to focus on. You know, uh, in the in the in the prelude, Wordsworth tried to make the common fantastic, and Coolridge tried to make the fantastic very common. Um, so, like, rhyme of the ancient mariner is is very. Um, it's not, I don't want to say brutal, but it, it has that kind of realism to the fantasy. I don't even like the word realism, but it's, it's, it's grounded in sensory experience. Whereas Wordsworth gets super, super philosophical about the ontology of flowers and things and common things he comes across. So there's, there's that piece. Um, but there's also a piece that, uh, find this here. Um, you know, the initial prompt, <laughs> see if I can find it. Like, okay, so the idea of children of promise. So you had kind of a son born according to the flesh and a son born according to the spirit. And the debate through the whole story is which one's which. Um, you know, who who is really the son born in the spirit? Who is really the son born in the flesh? Who's the Wordsworth? Who's the Coolridge? Uh, and I think it's it's hinted at. Uh, in the start here, but I don't know that it um, it necessarily um, plays out the way people will think it will. So, uh, so here's a great example of what I was referring to earlier. Uh, I'm going to share my screen because she's she's going to town here, and we're going to need. Yeah, I'm actually commenting more than I normally would. No, go. Um, yeah, give me. Benefit. Be brutal. Yeah, yeah. Well, also just my thoughts. I, I think I often involve my thoughts, but um, I am giving even more of a feedback than normal. Like, I don't think I'd normally, I don't know. I, I feel like I interacted with your piece a lot. Yeah. But um, we talked. I, I don't know that I necessarily wrote ha. Huh before or yep but i'm doing that for since i'm not talking for, for um, I guess so the viewers are getting my uh, initial reaction so okay i'm gonna present my screen whoa whoa 
Inception. Actually, I want to do that again just for fun. Man, that's a terrible idea. Um, so, oh, I did do it again. <laughs> all right, so here where she says, like, our play turned magical and really mundane all at once, thanks to a prayer and our heritage and what my better called good tilled earth. And she says, brother, because it syntactically looks like I meant brother there. Uh, actually, what I'm doing is basically referring to Tolkien without um, without outright saying, hey, I'm trying to be like Tolkien because I'm not. Um, but they think that is a good tee up both for expectations in the genre that are about to be broken, as well as um, that's what Southern Illinois is. You know, I feel like I grew up in the Shire. Uh, I used to say, you know, in Southern Illinois, you could see forever if it wasn't for the trees because it's super, super flat riverland with like nine rivers going into it. <clears throat> but there are all these cor co uh, corpses. <laughs> Those two, but copes, uh, this is of trees. Uh, and what great changes achieved by the letter R. Um, so I probably do need to go back in here and make it clear um, that I'm no longer talking about my brother and talking about someone else. Um, but, you know, it's a great example. Example of an instance in which, um, you know, she noticed something weird there but it wasn't necessarily my brother. Retrospect, I guess, then outsiders. Okay, she's right. There's no good transition there. Again, first draft, but I don't need a disclaimer because like I said, we're working on this at every step of the process. Okay, and I didn't even know that was in the chapter, but um, that's what I talked about earlier. Yeah, they did work as co-writers, Rebecca. Oh, got more stuff. Okay, so this is something I'm actually encountering a lot. Um, and it's not, this is a, this is a, an overflow of uh, the piece um, from earlier. Well, did that, is that? Hopefully that isn't doing that for the whole time. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to pull up the four hammers in the song. Oh, there we go. Working title. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I see what happened. Okay, so I'm going to go back through that real quick so that you guys can see because apparently that didn't transfer over like I wanted it to. So when I was talking about my brother, it's right here. Our play turned magical, really mundane all at once, thanks to a prayer. And our heritage, what my better, I'm referring to Tolkien, not my brother, but syntactically she's correct. So that needs fixed. Um Guess an outside observer. Yep. I'm just gonna delete that entirely. Whole cloth. Good note. So that was stuff I read earlier that she noticed. And we were both right. Both wrong. Co writers. Yep. They worked as co-writers. Okay, here we go. Narrator's voice. Um, so that took our whole lives and a ton of pain and pranks to realize it is something I've encountered often with this manuscript. And people either really get it or really don't. And it's profoundly frustrating to me because... 
don't get it. Don't get it for one of two reasons. Either they're honestly racist or classist and they don't want the living tongue of Southern Illinois, but I don't like the whole victim card thing that people pull. Um, so what's also happening is people's expectations of what Southern Illinois folk talk like is colorized by uh, California, Texas, the Bayou, even Tennessee. Um, and the grammar is not the same. And the reason is, is in Illinois and Indiana, not only do you, in Southern Illinois and Southern Indiana, not only do you have the Appalachian influence um, from the coal wars and the French influence from like the Louisiana purchase. Um, and you have um, some in the Northern, you have some of the influence from the Scandinavian countries. And that section specifically is where a ton of uh, Gaelic, uh, Gaelic Catholics, which is some of a lot of what uh, was the case with Appalachia, but Yiddish Germans settled simultaneously. And in Illinois, Illinois came into the union, not as a slave state. So there was actually not a ton of slavery in Southern Illinois. doesn't mean there wasn't racism, but it does mean that the dynamic was way later and way more subdued than most of the country. And as often thought of as a Northern state. Uh, so Southern Illinois doesn't, isn't, is a technically above the Mason Dixon line, but below route 70 is in the South. So it's this weird amalgamation of things. You know, you have like Yiddish um, kind of post-Jewish culture who know how to play euchre mixed with like the Appalachian grammar of, of um, you know, of the Catholic or, or Restoration movement sort of Cold War Appalachia. So it's, you're not always going to have the keep on the sunny side kind of uh you know, oh brother, where art thou culture, but you're also not always going to have like the Scandinavian slash super English, super rich French kind of thing going on either. It's, it's this interesting mashup and I haven't really encountered it anywhere until I moved to New York and I started hanging out with some guys who are, who are uh, a blend of Irish and, um, and, and German Jews here in the city reformed Jews who talk with a Brooklyn accent, but very similarly to how a lot of my kin and a lot of my kith and kin back in Southern Illinois talk. All of that to say, when I go in and I try to write that authentic pacing and dictum, people don't know what to do with it. The people that like it buy it almost immediately. Everyone else kind of really struggles to get through the voice because it sounds so different. Um, and I'm going to pull up a, a separate chapter. Hopefully this won't distract um, Rebecca too much, but I'm, I'm going to give you an example from the novel that um, I'm trying to sell right now. It's being read by the agents that I referenced earlier. Um, let's see if I can pull up some. What chapter it is. I think it's 76. Okay. Yeah. So this will give you an idea. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is, this is kind of a reference back to what we're pulling from narratively. Same narrator as the piece she's working on. Um, that night, he fought a groundhog underneath the house. Technically, they had a full basement, but it didn't cover the entire floor plan. Some of the house, the newer part, had a crawl space, space, and it was somewhere down in that crawl space. Remy heard a rumbling at around two in the morning. Beth said, oh, God almighty, the earth is swallowing the house like hell. Remy stirred awake. I was dreaming about tournaments. No time to talk about basketball. There's a monster under there, she said. Not basketball nights like Sir Lancelot used to fight in. Horseback with lances and Remy. I'm going. He got to going. Underneath that fiddleback infested crawl space, he used an old deer spotlight, you know, like hunters and the police both were used in the dark woods, one for the living and the other for the dead. At first, all Remy saw was fiddlebacks and Remy was scared. Kid in his youth had gotten bitten by one of those one time and it was like the living... Uh, 
It was like death itself started to rot that boy's arm off, spreading like, spreading like the plague, spreading like how rottle spread in a tree trunk, struck by light until it killed that boy. He moved past slow, scared for his life and his arms, shining that light further. He saw one of them groundhogs has started digging on the north side. So um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, but that's how my grandpa talks. That's how a lot of my f family talks. And they have they have kind of they kind of code switch, um, just like someone who's bilingual and Hispanic. Um, uh, Hispanic. Ugh in Spanish and English, um, in Hispanic cultures. Uh, also they found a friend of mine here who works at the children's museum. So they just found a, a, a study. They just discovered through the study that, um, that a lot of African American students are also code switching between two languages, the language they use at home, the language they use, um, you know, in school. And so they started teaching them as if they're bilingual and they're, the reading gap closed overnight between the black students and the more privileged students. Um, so it's kind of like that, you know, we have the safe talk the way we talk with everybody and then, and then kind of the public formal uh, code switching um, that takes a little more brain space. So like, this is a natural way for me to think. And, and that is an issue that comes up a lot. Um, so I, I don't know what I'll end up doing with that, but you know, if, if we um, go over to the working title document, you know, took our whole lives and a ton of pain and pranks to realize that that's the book you hold. Emerson said the city's recruited from the country. That's me and my magic rooted in the black soil of Bellhammer. So, you know, same kind of thing, but we'll see if I keep it. Uh, yeah, that's specific to my world. Um, I'm going to pull up the veil because some of you are unfamiliar with this. Buffering, loading. Okay, this is the veil. Uh, that's Georgia. Mm -mm -mm. Open image and new tab. Oh man, little bitty guy, really? All right, hold up, yo. I'm gonna have to go in the back office here. Man, the thing about living in New York is you, even if you don't listen to pop music, you still are always listening to pop music because of the restaurants and everything. I feel like, is this just, maybe this is everywhere else too, but I feel like songs that I don't want to know are stuck in my head all the live long day. And that's one of them. Hopefully you're enjoying Damien Gerardo. If you decided to pull that up and pull up the media library, because apparently I embedded that poorly. In today's world, you have to figure out all these other things that have nothing to do with writing just to survive. All right, maybe, possibly. We're referring to Nawad here for those who are just tuning in. If you're just tuning in, um, we are definitely having fun here with the Spark and Echo team, Rebecca of the Spark and Echo team who is in the process of her first glance at, pun intended, um, story that I'm working on for them. They've commissioned live streaming it because if I'm gonna do all this work to fix it after I'm already getting paid for it, I might as well um, show it to you. So this is my universe. Um, it is, It's complicated, <laughs> but what you need to know is there's Earth and Mars here, the real ones in our universe. There's seven stars, there's six tours, uh, there's 13 mounds, 
I think I got that right. And then there's permanent thresholds all around. And Nawad is this little guy right here. All right, there. Name and concepts were collaborated on with my buddy Alex Giltner, who is a professor at um, St. Francis in Indiana. But yeah, so Noad is is the second tour of the second system of the veil. And all of this out here is an empty space. It's what Lewis might call the womb of the worlds. It's thriving, teeming veil in which there are tours, mounds, major lights. So yes, Noad is that. Um, and some of those other names, you know, uh, yeah, I might as well just pull that up. Yeah, all of those. Negloa, uh, uh Regloa, all those old, old words are here. Negloa, which is a world made essentially out of silver. Galegloa is a world made out of gold. Regloa is a world made out of lava rocks, which when I mentioned the Kintsugi thing earlier, uh, this world here is a rogue planet after they rebel and start careening uh, as a rogue planet throughout outer space. Uh, they're punished by this star and the whole planet ruptures. And so there's a collaboration in this novel <clears throat> near the climax to try to get not only these two worlds to collaborate, but to metaphysically export their lava along with their gold in a molten way to basically Kintsugi the planet, which is Kintsugi. It's the art of fixing broken things with gold. Little bowls will crack and they'll fix it with, instead of just using like a super glue, they'll fix it up with gold. So it's that on a planet-wide scale, which is the main main objective of this novel is fix the broken rogue planet. So all of those names are Blazing World was also up there. Uh, yep, from the universe. Yeah, I can unpack that later. Um, or is it a reference to something else? Yeah, I do. So I'm going to have to go in and um, maybe just tee this up a little bit. I'm not sure what this is referring to. Oh, there we go. So that's a hard sell on me. Um, I, I side with the Vonnegut school of thought, um, which some of my friends really hate that I quote this. His whole, his whole thing on cre creative writing is hilarious. But he says, here's a lesson in creative writing. First rule, do not use semicolons. They are transvestite hermaphrodites representing absolutely nothing. All they do is show you've been to college. And I, I kind of side with that school of thought um, because a semicolon is just breaking up two clauses. You can do that with a period. You can do that with a dash. You can do that with a comma. You can do that with a colon. So if you need one to lead into another, you use a colon. If you need a hard break, you use a period. If you need a soft break, you use a comma. If you need a poetic break, you use a dash, just like Emily Dickinson. I don't know of any context outside those four in which you would need a semicolon unless you're speaking German, in which point English syntax doesn't apply. So I agree with him and even more strictly um, Cormac McCarthy, I think it just gets in the way. The exception might be philosophical or theological discourse, but that's not what we're doing here. So um, she likes fairy tale reference there in, in Robin Hood Estates. How are we doing, Rebecca? Are you doing all right? Yeah, 
yeah, doing good. Um, I don't know if it keeps showing up or not. Uh, I keep, when I try to make a comment, there's a couple, I keep hitting the wrong short command. So a box might keep opening up. Um, nope. There's no real reason for that other than it's an accident. Nope. Uh, we're just showing, showing. My I mean, it's not happening right now. It's just uh, sometimes I'll be leaving a comment and I'll go to hit like little command enter to shut it out and it opens up something else instead. So if that has been showing up at all. I've been screen you... sharing as I go. Um, so, you know, we're not to where you're at yet. So most of that's been covered. I've been going back and forth on occasion to see where you're at. Um, okay, cool. But I'm higher up in the document. So um, Great. I might in a little bit have you riff on what you think so far so that I can turn on the tea kettle because my throat is going to need tea. <laughs> I understand that. I think about the time that you got sick, I also got sick. So I understand. Oh, the man. Of tea. It's a, it's a digitally communicable disease. Yep. Mine ended up being allergies mostly actually. A digitally communicable allergic reaction. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, I'm going to comment on this a little bit and then I'm going to kick it over to you so that I can uh, <coughs> make, and that would probably be a good time for you to talk about what Spark and Echo is because it might take a couple of minutes to do that. And that would give people a little, little primer into why we're doing this and so forth. Um, okay. But I'll go for a little while longer here to push my voice box to the brink. Okie dokie. Okay. So Robin Hood Estates uh, likes fairy tale reference. The fun, the fun part about that is, and this has happened throughout this whole uh, series, um, especially with my, like people who are close to me. I, I wrote a poem about this that was just published in the uh, Zoetic Press their non-binary review. It's a it's a poem called "Waiting for the Train." It's bit based based on uh, Clive Barker's "Midnight Meat Train," as well as a lot of my experiences here on late night subway platforms. And um, it's a phenomenon that happens on the subway, but it also happens in life. And so we are in Sunset Park at Thirty Sixth Street. Uh, the DNR stop, I say the do not resuscitate stop because when the trains are down, they're down for good and it's not the kind of place you'd want to get shanked with a prison shank. But um, the neighborhood's fine. I just joke about that. DNR, um, the D and the N are both express lines. If I live 10 blocks north, at, at, put on my, my face while I'm saying this because there's no reason to be screen presenting. If I live just 10 blocks to the north um, on 25th Street, I'm on the R line only. So I either have to go south to catch an express line or I have to um, just ride the R north all the way to Atlantic and then go from there, which is adds anywhere from 15 to 40 minutes to your commute, depending on the time. So by living 10 blocks south, of Manhattan, I'm actually closer to Manhattan because I can catch the end train, which is three stops away from Times, or sorry, one, two, three stops away from Union Square and then five from Times Square. Uh, roughly the same with the D train. It's very, very quick to get into the city from here, not from 10 blocks north and not from 20 blocks north. So I could, I could live closer to downtown and it would actually increase my commute time, um, which is hilarious. So the line for that in that poem I wrote um, is to be so nearby so far, so far because so close. And I think that happens often when like people, it also happens in life often when you're making something and people who are close to you read that thing and they think, oh, this is a reference to that almost every time my wife has said, you know, this is because of this, that, and the other. And it's just like something I made up. There's no reference to it. And then there's other times she'll say, this is, this is hilarious. This is really good, you know, made up stuff. And I'm like, I didn't make any of that up. That's exactly what happened to my grandpa, like verbatim. I took it from his lips and wrote it down. Um, 
my buddy uh, read a piece not too long ago that was published, and, and there was a just a onomop, onomatopoeia I used in it, uh, which I don't use a lot, but I used it there. And he thought I was referring to a song we used to like as kids uh, by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Had nothing to do with that, but because he was close to me, he was trying to read into every rock and stock and stone. Um, so sometimes it's better to be farther away, which um, which is great because in this in this instance, I'm going to pull up the presentation once more. Um, in this instance, you know she likes the Robin Hood Estates fairy tale reference here, <clears throat> which is which is great. Um, and and what I'm going for in that piece, fun fact, that was the name of the real neighborhood in the place that Bellhammer is roughly based on. Um, so, yeah, so here's a, the thing, and this is something I don't know that I'll ever mention because this is the way people talk in the region. Um, I might need to, I don't know. Bellhammer is the town, Marion County is the county, Little Egypt is the region, Illinois is the state. And the reason Little Egypt is important is because people in Little Egypt don't are constantly trying to contrast themselves with Chicago. They side with St. Louis with ball teams. They side with Indianapolis with games. They side with Nashville with music. Like they're constantly trying to show themselves as different than Chicago. And it's the place that fed uh, the country and the world in the middle of the, the Dust Bowl, the biodiversity stuff um, kind of got, you know, wiped out the Dust Bowl. And um, they stockpiled food and kind of like Joseph and Potiphar, they had all this stockpiled food that fed folks. And so there's that, there's the Roma influence, uh, a lot of Roma um, gypsies, you know, Egypt um, ended up naming towns after, um, you know, Egyptian names. Uh, there's Cairo like Cairo, Egypt, they call it Cairo, like the syrup, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of names like that. Anyway, so that's the region. And yeah, the list of location, this full list of locations is important. It might be a better way to say that, but yep. You know, my pop all the time. Um, the parentheses mean that it's an aside, but it's in conversation, so it's unnecessary. It's a stylistic thing I did, which was completely hypocritical after saying everything I said about, um, semicolon, so I'm going to take that out. Good eye. Similar to California. Yes, indeed. Um, although California is a weird polarity i mean some of it's you know if you want to take the liberal conservative dichotomy which i think is problematic in a lot of ways um certainly hot cold it's similar to california but they yeah that's a, a lot of different um it's like let me see if i can pull san diego is interesting because you got San Francisco here. It's basically let's see if I'm remembering right or not. Come on, Google Maps. Help me, buddy. Don't you want some state to map? So I don't know if we know this or not, but I am actually so let's see. Lancelot, you are in Brooklyn. I am yeah. in California. And I'm a California coast. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a California native. <clears throat> and what I was thinking of was not just the geographical difference, um, but also the cultural. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Not just not just in how um, you know, conservative liberal, although that is certainly a thing. But um, just the, so I'm a Southern California native. Uh, I feel like I have to say that because it's very different from Central and Northern California. 
Where at Southern Cal? Hmm? Where at Southern Cal? Um, so I live now in Sacramento. But um, you're na you said you're Southern California native. I am. I was born in, so this is where it gets like tricky, right? With cultural differences. I was born in Orange County, raised in Orange County, but mm -hmm. the area where I was raised was in North Orange County, which was closer to LA, LA County. And so culturally speaking, I am more LA than I am Orange County. What, and what, uh, what, what city? Uh, I was raised in Brea. Oh, okay. Tiny little town. Well, I mean, for, you know, Orange County. What's it near? It's small. Hmm? What's it near? Fullerton. <laughs> it's uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes north of Disneyland if you don't hit traffic. Oh, wow. Okay. If you do hit traffic, it could be 45 minutes to longer. I feel like anybody who's not 45 there. minutes to longer is the definition of California. Okay, anyone who's been to California will know and will probably be laughing right now. Um, you could take side streets and probably make it in 45 minutes if it's, you know, not too bad. I went to college in Costa Mesa and okay. um, <clears throat> going up the five, I've learned uh, moving up here, that is a regional saying the five. Yeah. Um, but if you're going up the freeway, you have until about one o'clock in the afternoon before you start hitting traffic. And if you hit three o'clock, you're just going to be, sorry, not the five, the 55. I was gonna say it that. basically dead ends into the ocean. And there's kind of one freeway in and out during the part where I lived. Shit. And um, if you don't get out before three o'clock, you're just going to be stuck there till like eight. Oh, um, Lord. Yeah, so because traffic's just so bad, like I just didn't even bother. And so sometimes four I hours. would take, yeah, yeah, four hours of just like traffic's just terrible. So don't get on the freeway if you don't have to. Um, so I would sometimes take a road called Harbor. Um, this is weird to me because like anybody who's a Southern California native or to the area like knows what I'm talking about. But if you're not, you probably don't. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't even know what a car is anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're great. They're great. It's like you know, traffic. Um, but yeah, I could take I could take Harbor and that would maybe take me I'm trying to remember, I think an hour and a half. Okay. To get home. And that was side streets. But if I didn't, if if traffic was fine, if the freeways were clear, it was like a 30 minute drive. Dear Lord. So I, that's could, just, I can never go back to that. Ever. You can never go you know, back to that. Did you live in it before? I mean, enough. I had enough time in Detroit. I mean, even Joplin traffic like stresses me out now. Mm -hmm. Which people are like, what are you talking about? New York traffic. I never take cabs. I am morally opposed to Uber. Like I can't do uh, it. Like I just can't do it. That's hysterical. Uh, yeah. Um. For me, I'd rather I, walk. Because I've grown up in it. Like it is just a part of how I was raised. It doesn't bother me. Um, <laughs> Here, kids, I mean, play poker. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> they heard kids when you were young. <laughs> no, no. My, actually, oh. my, my mom would hand, or my dad would hand me a map and figure out, we'd figure out ways to get around before the days of uh, GPS. But um, the way I was raised, especially by my mom, was you just know when traffic is bad. Okay. Um, you know when rush hour the windows of rush hour, right? So like when I was living in Costa Mesa, which is like basically right next up to the beach, you know, traffic going north was mm -hmm. about, you know, rush hours, four hours long, um, maybe five. Gee. And how do people uh, like survive? Well, we just- Like that is a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, really, like that's a zombie apocalypse. Like that is- gridlock to like with basically corpses in cars right well i mean as a student um i had a more flexible time frame right so i didn't have to travel during those hours so if it was between three and and eight or seven so it was kind of like seven or eight was when it would start opening up by eight o'clock it was definitely open again i just wouldn't take the freeway 
you know, like you find something else to do. Um, if you know, or you you either leave earlier or you leave late. Like you plan for it, and if it's during that time and you're stuck, it's like, well, better find something else to do. That you know, being if you need to be productive, be productive with your time, or you take side streets. And you know, it was still going to be faster for me taking side streets than it was on the freeway. Oh, also though, I should note my I had a really old car and it didn't handle idling well. So, <laughs> I would take side streets so that I wasn't just sitting on the freeway burning up my engine. So I don't know. Maybe if someone had a car that like worked fine, then you could be on the freeway sitting. But I just preferred like even, I don't know. I just preferred to be going even if it's slow. So yeah. And then when I lived in LA, I moved to LA for grad school. I was in Pasadena. Kind of similar. You just knew when, I don't know, this is how I've been raised. Like, you know when rush hour is, and so you don't get on the freeway at that time. You just don't. Um, and if you absolutely have to, it's going to suck. And you take side streets if you can. And when I was working, um, I've done a few things in my life. And a part of it was I was a hospital chaplain, and I worked okay. – yeah, I lived in Highland Park and I worked in Burbank and I had to do the, you know, traffic hour thing. It was, it's basically the only time in my life that I've had to do that because um, I've had other jobs that don't necessarily require traveling during rush hour. Um, but I would just listen to audiobooks. Is Burbank like a hot car place? I'm seeing all these. No, it's, it's just LA. Okay, there's just like all these random car pictures when I. Burbank is, um, when you think of Hollywood, there are a lot of film studios out there. That'd be it. So it's a really pretty area. Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like the kind of bifurcation that I'm talking about, um, you know, between the North and the South. I yeah. Mean, yeah. All I think of when I think of Northern California. And I know there's people that are going to hate me for the stereotype, but all I think of is Oakland and, and like, <laughs> and like the difference between New York Occupy and Oakland Occupy. That's funny. Um, and yeah, like all that entails. So then central California is also something of a bread basket. Um, I think we feed, I don't remember the statistics anymore, but we feed a lot of the country from central California um, and then you go more north than that, and it's like our redwoods. It's actually very rural. Um, it's uh, kind of where the main like California dissenters live, the ones who like want to break off from like the rest of California because they blame like Southern California for taking all their water, but like really Central California needs a lot of it as well. So it's just <clears throat> like if you get into certain parts in Northern California, it'll say like "Welcome to the state of Jefferson." Because <laughs> they don't want to be California, so yeah, that, I think there's a lot of, <laughs> and I, I mean, essentially, so this this is fascinating to me because huge tangent. <laughs> no, it's actually a very important tangent because um, this is happening in in New York too. So there's like New York City. Mm -hmm. There's like upstate that uh -huh. New York City thinks of as upstate, but people uh -huh. get offended when they get called upstate. Like if you tell someone, like we've got neighbors here that whose parents live in West Westchester, uh -huh. uh, a couple of them. And we think of that as upstate because- Can you, can you show on your map where that is? Cause I don't yeah, know. Maybe our viewers would like to know. Uh, New York City. You can show Westchester. See, you guys have cars, we have towers. Yeah, <laughs> I love New York City. I was just there last week. But okay. yeah. Oh man, next time you got a shot at us. Yeah. Oh, maybe I, I, I wasn't. I didn't make it in time for your brunch, so. That's all right. It's a it's a party and a half. So this is White Plains, uh, Westchester County. So you see, like, this is the Bronx, and this is where New York City stops. So <laughs> there's the five boroughs, right? Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Staten Island is like a modern virgin, modern virgin, <laughs> whole, different, <laughs> whole different conversation than that, my friend. Uh, it's a modern, <laughs> yeah, take that Freud. How's that for a Freudian slip? <laughs> it comes out. Um, yeah, modern, modern 
version of uh, M. Night Shyamalan's uh, The Village. <laughs> it's like, it's very closed off, uh, very, you know, they, they, they charge more on this side of the, you know, going one way on the, <clears throat> the highway than the other to just try to keep the rest of New York out of Staten Island. And there's Brooklyn, BKNY, okay. Queens, Manhattan, um, and then Bronx, Yonkers, and uh, New Rochelle are, are what we think of as upstate because typically speaking, we have to take like an MTA North train to get up there. New Rochelle, Harrison, Port Chester, Finch. Uh, this is this is what's called the New Haven line. Uh, so it goes all the way out here, you know, Bridgeport, West Haven, New Haven. So this is Bridgeport, Connecticut right here, that's mm -hmm. Connecticut. What? Yeah, so that's Connecticut. This is Long Island. The, the west end of Long Island is Brooklyn. The the east end of Long Island is the Hamptons. And East Coast I mean, is weird. Well, if you zoom all the way out, you'll see it. Like it's called Long Island because it's that Long Island right there yeah. that you know on the on a globe. So if you pop back in, you know, Riverhead is where my mentor Dave Smith used to live, and it's literally right at the Riverhead. Like there are houses that are just like basically at the mouth of the river, and they wash out into the ocean. There's a horror writer I know that writes stuff on Shelter Island. You can only get there by ferry, which is an amazing place to write a horror novel. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Way to get back. Um, but That's where work? you want to be during the zombie apocalypse. Uh, not a bad idea or maybe a terrible idea. It depends on how that washed out. Yeah, uh, if there's no zombies on that island, that's where you want to live. True that, double true. It definitely didn't work out so well in the stand, but yeah. um, so there's a there's a ferry here from Port Jefferson to Bridgeport. So when I worked out here on like Northport, Port Jeff, uh, on the weekends, there you know it's a two hour commute from Brooklyn, and then there's a ferry that goes straight across to Bridgeport. So in theory, I can take a two hour train, see Port Jeff, stay the night, take a ferry up to Bridgeport, mm -hmm. and have my friends who are in Providence meet me here and spend the day in New Haven which is where the New Haven Review and Yale's hat, which is kind of kind of wild. But so that's that's the New Haven line. Then there's another line that goes up this way and the Poughkeepsie line goes up the west, <coughs> uh, up the Hudson River, which is what comes out right here on the west side of Manhattan. And then there's the East River, which is over here, which technically isn't a river. It's more of like an inlet, uh, but this is all estuary. The upper bay, Hudson Bay, all goes in here. And that's right where Sandy went. It hit Long Beach and then came right in mm -hmm. to the battery, which no tornado or tornado. It's a Joplin speaking. No uh, hurricane had ever done before. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so people think of this as upstate. These people get offended because, like, they're like, dude, we are literally, you know, like yeah. the drive mm -hmm. into the city. But so there's this kind of, you know, GMA. You know, you, the New York City is is 8.5 million, but the GMA, Greater Metropolitan Area, is like 20 million. Mm -hmm. The East Coast just functions like one giant city anyway. But yeah. all the way up here in Albany, which is the capital, obviously, and then Syracuse, Buffalo, and that's where <laughs> falls. The political difference between these <laughs> two places and, and even up here, I mean, this is Vermont, you know. There's oh. Burlington, Vermont, which is Bernie Sanders town. Oh. And and then, you know, just lives in the river there. Ozable Chasm. Never even heard of that place before. Shout out to Ozable Chasm if you're up there. Stevens Landing just sold some poems to um, Saranac Lake. Um, their uh, Adirondack Center for Writing. So that's very, very different. And it's the same kind of thing. You know, there's this urban rural dichotomy happening. Oh, yeah. So like Philly or Pennsylvania, you know, like Columbus, Ohio, and, and Greenville or or Detroit and freaking Mackinac Island. There's, part of my yeah, go for it. Part of my New York adventure that ended on Saturday. Actually, I was out in New York for ten days. Um, <clears throat> about half of that, I was in the city. Before that, I was legit in upstate New York visiting family um, in a tiny little town called Ripley. Believe it or not. Uh, but if you want to look at your map again. Um, oh. Where's the map? It's map? out near, it's actually, it's, it's closer to Pennsylvania. Ripley, New York? Yep. It, um, it, kind of in holy. Chautauqua County. It's got legitimately one stoplight. Uh, shout out to Heritage Wine Cellars and Kinsey's Cellars. I've been there. I've been to Kinsey. It's yeah. really good. 
Yeah. Have you been to Forsyth? Uh, I can't remember. I'm a little bit more on the side of Sickles personally, but. Um, I'm a big fan of, it's really funny actually when they're Westfield, like so where, where my family is in Ripley, you have to go east to go to Westfield. But if you look <laughs> west, there's northeast. That's there. Pennsylvania. Right there. Right there. That's Pennsylvania, northeast. So <laughs> you got you got to go west to get to northeast, and you got to go east to get to Westfield, which cracks me up. Oh, that's. Um, so if you're going to get into Ripley, you either are going to fly into Buffalo, which is you know an hour and a half away uh, northeast, or you're going to fly into Erie, which is 20 minutes west in PA. Or what we did this first time ever was we flew into Cleveland, Ohio, and then drove. So like in two oh, hours. What? Wait, we, this we, is we, Ohio right here. Yeah, I, I yeah, there's Cleveland. Wow. So within two hours, we drove through like three states, or you know, that's one, like the West Virginia, had, but it's on the north side of Penn. Yeah, and it just like for me, like it's super confusing because I'm from California where. I can drive from LA to Sacramento in five or six hours, and that's like maybe half of the state. Yeah, kind of like Texas. Texas. Yeah. To drive through. Yeah, and like I'm sure going east west would you know be shorter. I that's not ever something I've ever wanted to do because it's hot. The more east you go in California. Um, well, if you go east far enough, it's cold again. Yeah. That's true. It's true. In, yeah, you can go, you know, one, two, three, four. You go east four. far enough, it's not just, so, you know, it's it's also wet and there's an ocean. If you go east far enough, you die. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the, uh, yeah. So when you have like the difference, it was like, oh, yeah, I know that difference. Sure. Like, yeah. And, and you know, where my, my family, so I have family actually up in Ripley. Um, it's very Appalachian. Apparently, the culture is more Appalachian. So then you go to New York City, and it's like, the, what? This is the what? This is the same state. So yeah, kind of probably similar to like Jefferson, and um, you know, Southern California. Yeah, or you even have the Indy Loop, <laughs> which is just. Shout out to all my friends in Indianapolis. I'm so sorry for the loop, but. You have that, and then you know, Bloomington, Bedford area, or even down in Princeton, you know, Jasper, San, Santa Claus, Indiana, where where holiday what? is. Yeah, Santa what? Claus. You never I seen. I want to go Island? there. No, is it Christmas Town all the time? Yeah, well, it used to be Santa uh, Claus land, and then it became Holiday World. What? Thanks to do in Santa Claus, Indiana, Holiday World, and Splash and Safari. What? Yep. That's uh, weird. Oh, of course the Koch brothers would own it. Good night. My childhood is ruined. Mm -hmm. um, the Koch brothers bought out Santa Claus. What are you talking about? Oh, man. Sorry for your childhood. I don't know who the Koch brothers are. You don't know who the Koch brothers are? No. The largest coal and oil lobbying oh. family in the world. Oh, how fun. Um, yeah, they definitely killed they're the guys Santa. That, they're the guys that flat out <laughs> buy elections. Uh, <laughs> so Santa's World. play used to be powered by magic. Now it's powered by coal. Oh, it's powered by coal. Oh wait, so that's where Santa gets his supply of coal from, though. Yeah, I actually this wrote a post on that. I wrote a post on the metaphysics of of Santa's coal. It's on my site if you want it. But the, so yeah, so this is anyway. I, I think um, I read it. Had to do with field, but the, so so so. But this is a huge tangent this is, now. No, it's I, I can bring it back. I promise. <laughs> okay, this is, good. This is actually a huge contrast <laughs> with Indiana. Obviously, like you know, little bit kind of rustic, lots of wooden coasters, kind of you know hill country. Uh, like that's what it looks like. You know, just random roller coasters in the middle of like farms, <laughs> and. This novel is mainly about that urban rural dichotomy that we've been talking about for the past, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, in California, in New York, and but the way it met the way it metaphors it, I'm gonna roll with that. Um, <laughs> the way it elucidates it is 
instead of talking about the rural, it talks about the magical world, the universe, the big, because that's a, typically what we're talking about when we talk about um, the, uh, you know, the city, like when Emerson says, and I, I mentioned in that piece, like the city's recruited from the country, that's kind of what we're getting at is this universality or collaboration or, you know, mm -hmm. census building versus hedging in, closing off, you know, small community kind of thing, which is a lot of the contrast. Those, those questions are brought up. I don't, I guess the walking dead is just really on my brain right now, but um, but yeah, so that is coming up a lot and that dichotomy is very, very present in, and Illinois is a long state, um, you know, the urban rural divide. So I'm going to punt it over to Rebecca so that I can start up my teapot. And that is not loud and annoying for you guys. She's going to talk a little bit about Spark and Echo and then probably dig in um, to her stuff. So I'm going to hit present to everyone on you. Actually, and as you um, are running away, I want to talk a little bit about, I think I highlighted earlier and said how much I loved the thing about um the difference or the dichotomy or whatever of like everything's magical versus everything's mundane these kind of two brothers coleridge and whitworth and maybe i am butchering uh what you meant in my synopsis um but i really love that because that is something i think a lot about personally uh, the theology of aesthetics which is the theology of beauty um and when looking at you know art and beauty and finding beauty in the mundane, um, in the everyday, in the boring, uh, I think it was American Beauty, that the guy's videoing the trash bag that's dancing because he says it's beautiful. I haven't actually seen that movie, so sorry if I just butchered that as well. I might just butcher all the things. Um, so <clears throat> that's uh, just, I really jive with that. Um, and then, you know, how, how beauty and holiness is, it's separate from us, but it's also with us, it's incarnate. Um, I just super love that stuff. So that's maybe partly why I like fairy tales so much. I don't know. Um, anyway, yes, so hi, I'm Rebecca Testrake. I am the program manager at Spark and Echo. Um, if you have been an artist with us, you have, I'm sure, emailed me um and we've worked and stuff and i get your contracts out and try to send you reminders and sometimes i forget but um i joke that i am a professional cat herder sometimes um because you know artists we kind of go off and do things sometimes um so i say it with much love um so yeah spark and echo we are it was founded by jonathan and emily roberts um jonathan shout out beacon new york um i don't know where that lines up in lancelot's <laughs> um, he, he's from beacon yeah. is he still living yeah are we gonna beacon like once every other year like you should be friends with him he's oh, man. great I had no idea he was in Beacon. Yeah, I love Beacon. Yeah, Jonathan's like the nicest guy ever. If you ever get to meet him, people who know him. Hi, Jonathan. This might be embarrassing for you. Uh, just This is Jonathan Jonathan fan club time right now. He's like the nicest guy, and he's a musician, and he's got Ooh, kids. Nice guy, musician, and Beacon. And he's, and he's like super clever, and he's got a podcast called Composer Dad versus the Bible, and it's really funny. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, he and his wife founded it, um, and the goal, I, I think the, she's like, Spark and Echo Trivia Time, I think the original name was like Bible Comforte or something like that, um, and then they changed it to Spark and Echo Arts, which I'm really glad, because for one thing, I have a hard time pronouncing Comforte, and even knowing if I'm saying that right. Um, but the idea with Spark and Echo is that the scripture is the spark, and the the spark of inspiration and the echo is that which we create. Um, starting from your reader response, right? But then as artists, we create something in an echo of that. Um, and the goal is to illuminate the entire Bible with art of all different varieties. Um, so we're talking music, 
Lancelot's a writer, um, visual. We've commissioned a spice artist once. We've commissioned um, fashion photographers. I would love to get maybe some floral arrangers or um, definitely would really enjoy getting some special effects makeup artists in there. Um, had that I know kind some of, on the of all of those for the record. Hmm? I know some of all of those for the record. Bring them. I was talking with a um, with a special effects makeup artist, and it it didn't work out for that particular project. But would love to do that. Um, we offer commissions to people um, literally all over the world, which is really exciting, and of all different backgrounds and beliefs. So we have commissioned. I mean, obviously, I feel like Christian who finds the Bible to be God inspired and knows there's knows the Bible deeply. Like that's kind of an easy, obvious fit, but we also really love um, commissioning people who have never read it before at all, who maybe don't hold to a faith at all. Maybe they don't even believe God exists, but the Bible in and of itself as a text is still a really important piece of literature that has had a high amount of impact on our culture. So kind of wherever you are in terms of belief, orientation, um, familiarity with scripture, like we want, we want that voice. Um, for Jonathan and me, especially, it's really important that we get people who might not be like the most obvious choice because those voices, the voices of the marginalized are really important. Um, so kind of our thing is that you be excellent in your craft, that you come to the text without a bias um, and that you respond honestly, respecting the text and your audience. And those are the things that we require in order to get a commission from us. Um, and we love supporting artists and their creativity. When Lancelot was talking about um, his project and kind of this idea of coming up alongside him and you know kind of partnering with him in the creation of this book, it was just a really exciting idea when he talked about like, hey, let's pull back that lid some way and and show them what the process of creation is like. I was just thrilled. I think that's so exciting and also really scary um, as an artist as well. Um, I don't like showing people the process. It's really vulnerable. So uh, hats off to you, Lancelot, for being vulnerable and being willing to show us stuff that is not polished and, you know, there's always that fear of like, what if I'm creating crap? Um, it's a fear we all have as artists. And so. I, that's a secret I probably am, but hopefully <laughs> people watching, they make, they make less a, crappy stuff than me. I have, a, I have a book that I was given that I still haven't finished. <laughs> Just silly, cause it's a very small book called Art and Fear. Um, and it's kind of like this, like, hey, fear, fear is a thing that all artists have, the fear of making something bad, the fear of being an imposter, especially if, like me, you haven't created in a while. You're like, am I still an artist? Maybe I'm just a liar. Maybe I'm just a poser. Like, that insecurity is something that we all deal with. So yeah. here I got on a tangent again. But no. bringing it back to um, Lancelot and this project, I find it super <laughs> exciting that – he is willing to kind of pull back that curtain um, as a way of encouraging artists um, and showing like, hey, yeah, you're probably not going to wake up and just like puke out a Picasso that's finished and amazing. I love that metaphor because it implies that <clears throat> and that I'm a fraud and that everyone else gets to benefit from my demise. <laughs> I was totally going with the, yeah, fuck the quarter. <clears throat> You're not going to be demised. I'm not even sure that's that's accurate, but I'm going with it. <laughs> yeah. Meaning Shakespeare with, made up a ton of words. Yep, so I take achieved. You're good. I take lots of liberties with English. Yeah. Um 
All right. Well, that's a bit on Spark and Echo. Sorry, I was looking for something. Yeah. Um, so we'll get back into it for a little bit here and see if we can't finish it out. Um, yeah. I'm on that. page my three of five, I think. Three of five. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then we can talk overall stuff, and then I will get to revisions. Uh, when's my deadline for this one? I have it written down somewhere. I just um, next week. I want to say it's I next think. Week. Yeah, it seems right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're really like really rigid here at yeah. Spark and Echo, yeah. as you can tell. I feel like, like I'm gonna be yeah firing squad very soon. Pretty sure it's next week. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Um, okay, yeah. cool. Uh, and then the other ones are throughout the year, right? We didn't end up going with the March April schedule. Correct. So okay. um, I got yeah. I got drafts of stuff. I'm just trying to pick what. Ooh, all of it. <laughs> you can't have the whole novel. <laughs> all of it. Um, <clears throat> viewers. Um, so this is the behind the scenes of what Lancelot will be presenting. I suppose that's an important part. So we generally offer um, commissions that are for one one off projects. Some artists do a couple projects a year with us. Um, but Lancelot is our artist in residence for this year, which means that he will be working on a project that spans the course of a year. And um, in presenting the idea, there was a whole bunch of ideas of like him kind of going with like a, a Dickens thing where he kind of released stuff on kind of a periodical that built up into a story. Um, but fitting with the Spark and Echo um, format. Instead, what we're going to do is every three months, starting in March, um, he will be presenting his work, um, whatever that looks like according to his project. Um, so it seems like maybe it might be a chapter, or I'm not really sure what you're planning on presenting. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's still serialized. Um, <clears throat> it, but the, the hope is that it's, it's serialized. Um, in in a coherent way but i'm trying to make four chapters that function like a dog can you hear that she's really going at that bone um i lost it it cut out for me actually okay. so we'll see if it maybe <laughs> maybe the maybe our viewers get to hear that here um, see if she's down there oh hi pup yeah. Meanwhile, mine is sleeping right next to me. I'm going to make you very sad. Mine is, mine is bone drunk. Come here. Come here. Hey, everyone. Um, oops. There goes my desk. There goes my office. <laughs> <laughs> this is Teacup. Hi, Teacup. She's got a, she's got a bandana. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Teacup. Meet, Hi, Teacup. Meet T. Stein. Oh, mm -hmm. T. Stein. So yeah, so what I'm actually doing is trying to make them self-contained right. um, more or less within the prompt and then also serialized and also s chapters of novels because I like creative limitations that are so strict. I am almost certain to fail. <laughs> Yay! Uh, yeah. So... <laughs> so um, normally what our viewers would see is in March, you would see him present a chapter. And then in June, you'd see him present a chapter, September chapter, December chapter, kind of the finalization of the entire project. But what's happening instead here that's different is Lancelot is inviting people to see the behind the scenes work leading up to that. So maybe people will just see, you know, I'm sure there are some people who will just see that chapter that's presented, but for people who are interested, there's an invitation that Lancelot is offering to join into the background. Um, I think in offering the comment link, you can also do what I've been doing and writing feedback. Yeah, that is a thing if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, Our feedback is welcome. It is not always, um, it is not always what? Accepted. Followed. Accepted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, that's an idea. Thank you for that idea. I'll think about it. Not what I want to do. So, um, but the, the interaction, this is pretty special actually. Cause normally, you know, when someone, when a reader reads a work, 
the feedback kind of stays within your own head or maybe if you're in a class, you discuss it. Yeah. But the ability to dialogue with the author, actually dialogue with the author is pretty cool. Yeah, so, uh, and hopefully as we go, it'll, it'll progressively get better, uh, both in terms of live streaming and in terms of the work itself. But uh, yeah, you can drop comments into the chat. I haven't uh, seen anything yet, but um, I will continue to check that as we go. And and you can do it post view live stream um, as well. All right, cool. Well, we'll dive right back in and see if we can't get some more goodness by now i guarantee you are sick of hearing damian gerardo so i would recommend switching over to william fitzstein <coughs> and i'm gonna meet mute. holy crap that's hot tea don't do that to yourself um i'm gonna mute myself he uh he is one of my favorite musicians both as a person and in terms of uh, the writability of his his discography focuses a lot on St. Francis Sissy and we've been able to interact with him a couple of times um, here and in St. Louis and he's just a, a gentleman and a scholar so support William Fitzsimmons or not did I say William Fitzsimmons uh, he's good too I met Denison Whitmer S-O-N W-I-T-M-E-R he's launching an album soon Anyone so, who's a like, uh, Mennonite guy in PA, uh, let's see, share a screen. Anyone who's a friend uh, of St. Francis know. is okay by me. Try to catch up to her here. I am presenting. All right. Very long state. Very long digression on a very long state uh, from earlier. And I'm not muted, am I? Sweet. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that dash. That's good. I'll receive it. Uh, South and Central. That's the actual name. Does it communicate that it's the actual name? With Nine Rivers, Threshold, Watch the Dust Bowl, Joseph and Pharaoh, Southern and Central Illinois, Little Egypt. Oh, she said yeah, he's kind of having a dialogue with her, and that's kind of how people talk ish. I think. Um, oh gosh, I'm so sorry for that flight delay in Chicago. That's that's the worst. Not connected to Bluebeard at all. Are you talking about the same Bluebeard? I think you're talking about this guy. Yes, probably. Yes. See, because, yeah, fairy tale. See, because I thought, like, there was Robin Hood in Nottingham uh, and then Bluebeard. Sorry. And then there was this, like, winding around in the house that I was like, oh, is this what's happening? The answer is no. Blue house. Wait, What? Okay, so this wasn't intentional. This is a fascinating thing that happens. This is the other way. So I was talking earlier about how sometimes people think you're referencing something from your real life that you're not. Uh, other times is you end up accidentally referencing things that are existing. So I've never heard of Bluebeard, Gustave Doré, Charles Perrault, French folktale. I'm going to learn now. Tale tells oh, stories of the violent man violent. Of murdering his wives and the attempts of one wife to avoid the fate of her predecessors. Sounds cheery, like most fairy tales. Yeah, there, and there's different, of course, there's different uh, endings. Uh, da, 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 da. A friend of mine, shout out to Heather. Okay. Heather. Bluebeard is wealthy and powerful. Watching this. Frighteningly shout ugly. out to you. We had a whole conversation about it. Beautiful women who have all mysteriously vanished. When Bluebeard visits his neighbor and asks to marry one of his daughters, the girls are terrified. After hosting a wonderful banquet, he chooses the youngest daughter to be his wife. Against her Bluebeard announces that he must leave for the country and gives the keys of the chateau to his wife. 
open able to open any door in the house with them, each of which contains some of the riches except for the underground chamber. <laughs> each <laughs> What's gonna happen? <laughs> Rubinzer suffers his wrath. She's overcome with the desire to see what the forbidden room holds and sneaks away into the party. Immediately discovers the room is flooded with blood and murdered corpses of Bluebeard's former wives hanging on hooks from the walls. Holy smokes. The French know how to write a fairy tale. She drops the key. Sleep well, children. She <laughs> blood key. Key is magical. Blood can't be removed. True story. If you ever try to get blood off a key. Uh, sources, commentaries. Yeah, I'd never heard of that before. So yeah, so in some versions, Blue Beard, Blue Beard comes home. A lot of room, a weird sort of arrangement around a kitchen island. Definitely not Blue Beard, but that's uh, disturbing enough. I need to read it sometime. Yeah, in some versions he kills her. In some versions, her brothers it's rescue spec her in time. It's, spec it's speculation. Um, like riding on spec. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's a good catch. Um, buying up lots, taking out loans to build houses in a subdivision. Building on speculation. Open others would buy. That their difference to his wisdom, long suffering. Slipped. When did it slip? With a great banana yellow hempen rope that burned the tar out of my hands when I gripped it too hard. And it slipped. It would. It had slipped. It had slipped. Maybe. I'll leave that note there. Thing. Rope. Yeah, good call. Syntactically vague. Uh, it's what's called a lexical ambiguity. It's not going to help us. I'm tempted to do this because people do that all the time with past tense in Southern Illinois. Finding it confuses educated folk in New York, which is hilarious um so i'm gonna keep it rope was well that sucks failed there great job of painting the scene but having a hard time picturing it that's not good so i need to revisit that whole paragraph because essentially what he's doing is tying this really thick hardy rope around a brick in order to throw it like a sling over the branch and if that is not communicated through sensory data and character action, there I need to read. Well, it's not. Says, I wasn't sure because it uh, talks it's about like the side branches wouldn't go over. Nope, you're right. The knots that so they that's were tying. Need to fix that. Kept on running. The nope. Knots. He's just afraid of the branch breaking. Okay. Scared it it's hard. <laughs> Scared it involved. Another way to talk. There's a lot of grammar like this uh, that I'm working into these novels. I have a whole um, that she's editing further down the line. I have a whole uh, let's see. More hammers. Whole thing. on a little Egypt grammar. Maybe it's in this. Yeah, so, um, you know, like about how case endings are actually a thing in Southern Illinois. It sounds like they're not, um, but nominative is tree, genitive with tree of trium, tree is, um, Date of tree and tree of tree of tree for and treat treat 
an accusative tree. So that is to say, instead of saying the tree of Charlie, they'll say the tree of Charlie. Or instead of saying the tree from the nursery, they'll say the tree in the nursery. Smashing the definite article together with the locative or dative noun. So tree in is used across the board for a tree in, a tree on. Uh, the H is more of a soft schwa sound. The upside down E meaning the soft uh, is not always a placeholder for thought. Um, like, for instance, Jerry took his little trucky and drove right in the tree while... Well, uh, tree will John. Uh, sorry, Jerry took his little truck and drove. <laughs> I need to slow down. Jerry took his little truck and drove her right in the tree. Well, uh, Jenny, she went and came out of the greenhouse and said, Not again. And Jerry said, Every damn Sunday. Uh, that's close, but that is almost unreadable. Uh, for verbs, is like present, I love you, passing, and love. Uh, uh, like passive. Uh, I'm loved, or him loved. Imperfect would be sloven. Us beloved. Uh, would love. It would have been loved. Um, have been loved. Future. Uh, or sorry, imperative. Beloved. He beloved them. Or beloved them. Like yeah, beloved. Um, loved. Been loved. Like, would have been loved. It's kind of one word for people. Uh, would have been loved. Perfect. Blue perfect passive. It sounds silly, but that's like, <laughs> like I said here, I don't want to, I don't want to play over the point. Um, but that won't communicate with urban educated audiences. But th my point is, it's actually a different language that's happening. I actually think it's a more educated language, it's a more educated way of speaking because it's, it's being proper to how the language works. So I've tried to find a, um, I don't know, like a happy medium between how the language is spoken and, and syntactically used and, you know, where it works well. So it had like, scared it fall. I don't think it's helpful to put contractions at the start of words in documents like this. It just confuse people like the Mark Twain thing. I don't think that's helpful. Um, so I steer away from that. But I, I do, I try to hint at it. There's a lot of things I chose not to do, even though that's how people talk because it's unintelligible in a document. But so it's a line to ride stylistically. Um, Yeah, it's probably good. And I was mad, you know. Uh, so especially in a story, uh, editors will always mark this because they want to hint that I know and they know and everybody reading knows that this means especially. But the trick is, a lot of narrators in Southern Illinois, when they say specially, they mean specially. Um, so the word especially is a great extent very much, right? But it comes from, hold on, especially, let's get dictionary. <clears throat> this is helpful for tools. If you're seeing this volume stuff here, these related keywords, this is a, keyword thing I use for my site called uh, Keywords Everywhere. You can just drop it into Chrome and it'll pop up uh, there, but especially the Wiktionary. Especial and Lee, right? That's the etymology. Especial from specialis, species. It's appearance, form, beauty, or specific to look. So, you know, something especially is in a special manner, a special way, a greater extent than normal. So if you look up special, from a special, special, from specialis, right? Same root etymology. So they're actually right to say specially is they're just using 
kind of an, an elided form of it. And it sounds unintelligent because people say it's not a word, but it, again, like we talked about, it achieves meaning. So I, I actually take out the apostrophe on all of those because they say specially and they mean specially. Um, but often they think that I'm ignorant of the fact that that happened. Yeah, let it go physically and quitting what they're doing, both. Um, he means both. Can't, I said, and went swinging harder and harder. I don't know why he can't, I can't, you know, why he says I can't stop. He just keeps doing it. Well, she wants to know why I keep using freeze. This is why. <laughs> Three is a magic number. Yes, it is. Can't play much more than that. It's fair usage policies, but that's why I use three. Now, older siblings often pick their younger. There is a different history being referenced there. Um, yes, older siblings do often pick on their younger, there is, but there is a specific way in which Toby picked on his little brother here that is being referenced, and um, that will hopefully come up in one of the stories later. I'm going to try to isolate the moments of misbelief that I've used and focus on just the break story. And hopefully there'll be some sort of... Uh, Reconciliation by the end of the four here. Is the rope super knotted up here still as well? Or is it an unknotted rope? Um, turn, well, he said turn loose, turn it loose. I did it unspooled like a drape. Drop ball of yarn, the brick landed. Both wins, you didn't. I said, yeah, I need it. so. So there's implied character action, kind of like Dostoevsky does here. A lot of times, Dostoevsky will have, um, he'll reference something that's happening in the dialogue. It's like, you know, and his mother said, "Now, honey, you just don't need to. Now, why did you pick up that knife? Put the knife down." And it doesn't say he picked up a knife. It, she's responding verbally to it. Um, So I can I can do that. I just need to say one more thing. That or or have a beat here where it says he took it off. Super super knotted up and knotted rope. Um, it does that. A capstan took me 30 minutes to look up because I couldn't find the right word. But it is the part of a ship where the rope is tied, like here, right? Or here, even on chains, right? So like that. And so what it's saying here without cinching or tying off his body like a capstan on a ship is he's, it's just another way of saying he's belaying, um, but is tying in the rope and nautical imagery a little tighter, literally. And literarily, his bigger body held my smaller, this important dynamic in the relationship. Nope, it's not. It's just character action caught me. I need to add that. That's good. Thanks. 
That's nice. The pond. Yeah, that's good. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um long and late coming the first one up there. bearings that's the time. yeah it's just referring to like everything that's in the far distance capstan oh <laughs> you looked it up a very it's my glasses does this mean he's got a thick body that seems to be made relationship to him? uh kind of yeah yeah it does it i mean he's definitely bigger boned than his than his brother um so like rotating like that works a little cleaner than it would on a skinny kid so yeah good eye that's that's one of the reasons like the most important parts of writing are nouns and verbs like when people get all crazy with adjectives and adverbs and stephen king or people like that rail against them, and then british friends of mine get upset when you rail against you know adjectives and adverbs the truth is like those things are there for when there's not a verb or a noun that can convey the metaphor of meaning you're trying to convey. And all meaning is wrapped up in metaphors. All the words we use, like even that, wrapped up in metaphor. Like words are metaphors. That's what language is. It's analogical. It refers to other thing when people are like, well, we're just arguing about semantics. All arguments have semantic content. You know, like that's just the way language works. So because of that, if you lean into that, <laughs> again, body metaphor here, but if you lean into that, you can end up using language that's super helpful, like capstan, that metaphor we started with of a body, well, that gives a little bit more context to what we mean. And, and so she's picking up here, like it's it's thicker in order, and, and so it works better for a belay of his little brother. And I don't need to say, I mean, of a body is technically a participle phrase, you know, capsaicin of a body, like it turns that into kind of an adjectival phrase, but it's it's rooted, it's two nouns, you know, and it's evokes a metaphor a lot stronger than if I just would have said thick body. Um, although a thick bodied wine is an appropriate thing to say at times, I suppose. You be careful. There's a way to accept in bulk. Not a fan of exclamation points, sorry. Take a lot for me to use an exclamation point. I mean, someone has to be really, really mad. Or shout like this. Oh, man, well, quick. that yeah that one should probably be that branch because how did trees smile well you're about to get that it is a normal thing from a tove Yeah, it's a good good catch with the hamsters. Yeah, old man Willow. 
did shout. It should have been clearer up here, though. So I should make that clearer here. I should do it here because this is actually a literative verse. So this is kind of a head nod to Tolkien again. But again, it's doing something different than Tolkien, and it's teeing that up. That it's teeing those assumptions up to use them later. But little learners leave not good branches, or you'll fall. Leave not good branches, or you'll fall. Breathe deep. Like those are those are two feet in a liter alliterative verse. Slow ye down and seek sleekly climb. That's a very tree entish sort of thing. That <clears throat> the way they talk. Um, I mean, tree beard palm. Very heroic meter. When spring unfolds, the beech and leaf and sap is in the bow. Oh, sorry, that's that's the that's the other one. Come back to me. Come back to me. I don't think that's the right one. Tribute poems. Tribute collection. Maybe this. Show you what I'm talking about. That's about tree beard. This is the difficult thing about Google is they actually want you to just search endlessly. They get paid for everyone, so those are stupid int jokes. Song of the Int Wives. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, there's another example. Um, Fall of Arthur poem. I have finished. Okay, cool. Well, I was trying to show an alliterative meter thing here, but um, let me burn through this real quick. I have a lot of questions now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's just talk through stuff. Let's switch over to visual stuff here because that'll be more entertaining for people, maybe. Although, I guess we're not doing this for entertainment's sake. But um, so I'm back to visual here, and then we can switch you back. It is dusk here. I don't know. I think um, I'm getting a weird loop with vocals. Um, audio but still I'm, I'm, yeah it came back i didn't have any before now um but the questions i don't know it might be helpful if you go through them um as you as they're embedded or whatever okay i'm trying my headphones can you hear me mm -hmm. okay um yeah you just shoot them at me as you go but <clears throat> I don't know where you were. Oh, where I was on the document, you mean? Yeah, because oh. that's the that's the questions. It's all it's all tied to the document. Oh, okay. Thank I was you. just really mostly just letting you know what's coming. Okay, let me pull this back up. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Slow to sound because of the, the lightning. Does he have thunder in him because of the lightning strike? Yeah, that's it's both in metaphor and literal. Uh, he's tall and thick and strong. I mean, why is it? But old man Willow, what what is the statement in contrast? Um, it's not so much there is. A, I mean, there is a contrast here but the main contrast is like that's just how kids talk i think like you know but tommy billy but you know like they like go back and forth like that but he's saying 
Mr. Oak will catch me, Hayden says. I think you'll find thunder in Mr. Oak is slow to sound, simmering bark. And if he's not responding. Oh. Old, see, I need to, part of the I, I kept missing the is, and so I was just confused by that sentence. Yeah, Mr. might queue up a period break in your mind, but. Um, no, it was, I didn't see is so i said or what i saw was i think you'll find thunder and mr oak slow to sound simmering bark or like it just it didn't it slow to sound is it a simmering bark no no it's a metaphor and, and part of part, again part of the problem is trying to convey the meaning mm -hmm. um like the semantic meaning here while retaining some of the alliterative meter, which is how they tend to talk, mm -hmm. I think you'll find the thunder in Mr. Oak, a slow to sound simmering bark. Um, it might be better with a colon there. Like what there. is simmering bark? It's, um, it's like a metaphor for what, it, it's the whole sentence wrapped up in two words. Mm -hmm. Thunder in Mr. Oak, a slow to sound simmering bark. It's like queuing up, like, don't you understand? Like that because the sky got struck by lightning, thunder in him is slow to sound. Um, and then Hayden's like, yeah, but he's tall and thick and strong. And I said, but old man Willow takes, takes me on wind sprints, see? And he's saying like, here is a living tree and why aren't you excited about this? Hayden's saying, because I'm in a giant tree. Mm -hmm. And they're arguing over which one's better. Uh, and there might be a way, better way to convey that. But the hope is that that Wordsworth Coolridge dichotomy will come out there at the end of Toby's like, no, really, a talking, walking tree. And Hayden's like, eh, it's not as tall as this oak. Mm -hmm. Which is like, why is that an <laughs> argument? But it is an argument, Hayden's mind. It's a legitimate argument because it's, it's kind of like my, my dad can beat up your dad. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's you know, not true, it's true in a sense. Um, so I probably need to go back in there and clean that up. But that's the hope. Uh, Old Man Willow takes me on wind sprints. Have they had this relationship with trees before? Uh, well, this is the first chapter of the whole novel. It's the first chapter of, oh, okay. um, and also of the commission, which is a piece of it. But yeah, Toby has Hayden, not as much, but they are slow. Also are little kids. They're not really surprised by it. So. Uh, we're talking about uh, nine, I think a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of <clears throat> talk about trees. Anyway, um, looked back. Very... Uh, yeah. How is it nobody else has heard or seen this connection? Commotion. Oh, commotion? Yeah. Uh, they might have. Um, that's a good question. I need to think about that. But they might have and might have not cared. The people in the story are aware of magic in the way okay. it's, it's kind of a parallel universe, but they just don't care in Southern Illinois because it's not useful. Okay. That so, makes a lot of sense then. I wasn't sure what the relationship kind of, of magic to the, I guess, mundane world was. Yeah. So that's the argument right is that toby the whole time is like holy crap magic and hayden is like yeah but it doesn't help me pay the bills mm -hmm. which is a legitimate argument i mean it's mm -hmm. a legitimate argument for molly weasley to be like who's gonna clean up these pots mm -hmm. like all you people are running around with boggarts and freaking avada cadavra i just need the dishes done you know like mm -hmm. uh which is nice that you know, Rowling gave us kind of those domestic scenes um, of, of, of really practical uses for magic. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the thing. I mean, there's, there's times where magic actually gets Hayden into trouble. There's times where he can snap his fingers and have a guitar tuned immediately, but he can't play guitar. And even if he could, no one can afford live music in Southern Illinois. So it's mm -hmm. like, why does that matter? You know? It's completely, mm -hmm. completely useless skill. Now, Toby looks at that as like, holy smokes, you just snapped your fingers and tuned a guitar. And he's like, so? 
you know? Mm -hmm. And those, that's kind of the, the frustration. So, um, so yeah, so I need to, whether or not people have seen it, that's a, that's a legitimate question. Our trees love or the lugged away. Kind of reminds me of the metaphor of the tornado. It also reminds me of the process of cutting down trees for lumber. Yeah, it's both. Um, it's funny because we think, you know, we think of really old trees, rightly so, as kind of elders, which is kind of Tolkien's thing. If we are going to cut down trees, the best trees to cut down are the oldest ones. Uh, because the young saplings have you know, 100 years of carbon storage left in them. And old trees are kind of like ripe fruit, if you think of it like a garden. So if you're actually going to be sustainable in the way you do it, what you want to do is trees that are old growth and are, are likely to fall of their own accord soon, rather than waiting for mushrooms to hollow them out or lightning to strike them or for erosion to take them, you wait till they're like essentially in their dotage and then, and then cut them down, you know, um, that or just do the grazing thing and wait for them to fall and don't cut any down. But, um, so that's kind of where that's coming from philosophically. It might be wrong, but uh, yeah, a little bit of foreshadowing. The parallel structure and tracking of the dual metaphors of wing materials. Yeah, I just got a little too flowery there. I need to cut that out. See all the treasure of the world from up here. Yeah, he's looking at the houses. I mean, I even need to say that, I guess. Hey, Brandon's popping Brandon's story. Uh, yeah, so stuff to work on there. Uh, part of the problem I have a lot of time is I forget to relay. This is, this is a perennial problem that I'll have for the rest of my life as a writer. I just forget to convey what I feel and see uh, in terms of sensory stuff because I'm so caught up in the intuition of it. And I think that happened here. So I need to go back in and add in some sensory data that I'm assuming but haven't communicated. I think that would help. Um, so that's good stuff. <laughs> what I really like about um this and the kind of as, as you've been talking about the different characters um and oh, it's getting darker here too <laughs> um you know what they value and the very very end um the uh, i can see the treasure of the world from up here and then but money can't buy courage um it's kind of the two the two brothers you know like Treasure is wonderful. Like, you know, we go on treasure hunts, these wonderful stories of, you know, finding treasure. Um, but I think the reason we like those is because they're not just about finding treasure, they're adventure stories that include courage and things like that. And so, uh, to Toby, you said, um, you know, yeah. he really values, it, I'm guessing, or it seems like those um, abstract things, like the magic and wonder and, courage and splendor and and those are really good things because they make us alive mm -hmm. but hayden really values the things that keep us alive <laughs> yeah. that's great but what's courage if you're starving you know or if you're dying so yeah it's a question of like how do you <laughs> how do you seek out virtue uh in the day-to-day -day stuff you know and it's there's a line at the end of a robert w service poem that i I turned into a song not too long ago, and it, it starts out saying, I wanted the gold, and I got it. I scrabbled and mucked like a slave. Was it famine or scurvy? I fought it, and I hurled my youth into the grave. And it, it goes on to this poem of him going into the Yukon and going to Alaska and hunt for all this gold and, and him falling more and more in love with the just harsh and bleakness of the land and how beautiful that is in its own way. And by the end, it's like... You know, I wanted the gold and I, and I got it. Um, and it, I don't remember exactly how it ends it, but it's, it's something along the lines of um, that it isn't the gold that I'm wanting. Mm. So, so much as just finding the gold. 
It's the great big broad land way up yonder. It's the forests where silence has lease. It's the beauty that fills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. Mm. And it's that. And the hope is by the end of the novel, and hopefully if I do it right, I can I can get a hints of it in, in these four short stories that are chapters of a broader work. If I, if I do it right, those will kind of evoke that for both of them. Like, what does courage look like for each of them, and what does uh, virtue look like for each of them, and what does actual physical like, <laughs> treasure look like? So we'll see. Well, it it right. kind of goes back to like, what does it mean to be alive? Yeah. And even the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and whether that's true or you know mm -hmm. whether there's another way of orienting um, the desires of the heart, you know, mm -hmm. um, Aquinas would or Boethius would talk about proximate goods and ultimate goods, mm -hmm. the idea of the things we long for and the longing behind the longing. Mm -hmm. Lewis talked about a lot in Surprised by Joy and in uh, in The Pilgrim's Regress about the old roads and there's, you know, my body longs for hunger, but it also longs for something that in the hunger that the, that food can't provide. Food can settle the hunger, but then there's this other longing that it doesn't quite quench. And food's a piece of it, but that's not really it. Yeah. And same with every other desire. So um, finding ways to manifest that is kind of a hope. We'll see. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, onward. Onward, I will get it revised and send it to you, and we'll have part one up, and then I'll try to live stream some more stuff as we get a little closer. Um, and if you if you want to send me anything privately, like this was terrible, write it from scratch or whatever, like it's not gonna hurt my feelings. I'll I'll fix it and uh, I'll get it to you guys. So, but hopefully this process was helpful to some. People showing kind of the dialogue with comments and and a lot you know a lot of those things were teed up because of confusion. I'm being unclear, um, but the, the meaning of what I was trying to achieve is is there and just need to be brought out a little more. So. I think that's kind of what good editing does, right? Is it helps. Um, the writers dial in that which is in their head and that they think is on the page, but it's just not quite as clear as it needs to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the drawing out by writing is rewriting. But. Yep. Sure. Okay, cool. Well, a uh, round of applause for uh, Rebecca and for her long suffering <laughs> and uh thank you guys for joining us hopefully it's helpful to somebody out there and we will see you next time if you want to make sure you get it i tend to send out an email about 30 minutes before we go live i might need to start doing that a little earlier i'm not sure but um but yeah these will be archived on uh, my youtube channel and they'll be there uh on spark and echo so we'll see you uh, next time Bye-bye.